Hello everyone this is part 6 of what if Naruto was betrayed and planned it all, and I hope you guys enjoy this video and to like, to subscribe, and check out the playlist, to see more comment down below, now let's start the, intro. The Sasuke was now sitting in the Hokage's office with Sunad, Kakashi, Chum, Jiraiya, Hyashi, Shibi, Kiba, a branch member Hyuga dressed as one would expect of a Hyuga member, and a member of the Avarain clan who was dressed as one would expect of an Avarain clan member. They were all tense. Chum, give your report. Sunad said, her hands folded in front of her face. She nodded. After you had me send our teams after Anko we were able to pick up a trail. With the fact that you had us start looking to the east we picked the trail up quickly, at least quickly for going after a special John and that's so good at covering their tracks. It was difficult but with the help of Jiraiya's network the trail led to a small village in hot water country. We kept our distance so that we didn't take the risk of alerting Anko and or Naruto. Good, now I'm going to set up a team to go capture Naruto and Anko and bring them back. Sasuke, you're going to be on this team to help fight Naruto while Kakashi will be going to help take care of Anko. I will also be sending this Hyuga branch member, Avarain clan member, Kiba, and a couple of Anbu. The Anbu will be helping with Anko while the rest will help you subdue Naruto. He shouldn't be that much of a threat, but he did train under Jiraiya for a short time and will no doubt be training with Anko as long as he can. You will all be moving out in an hour. Prepare whatever you need. Also, Jiraiya, you said you have something troubling to report. He stepped forward. Yes. I'm worried about the toads. I asked him to let me use the key to the seal of the QB. I was hoping that I could alter it in a way that would cripple his movements. Until now they never had a problem with me making small adjustments to the seal. They're hiding something, they're being less cooperative with me. Whenever I talk to them I can feel a tension in the air. Something's wrong but when I asked them about it they said that they were simply focused on troubling matters that couldn't be discussed. They're hiding something but I won't be getting it out of them any time soon. It's almost like they're preparing for something, and it makes me uneasy. Doesn't feel right. Break. The boy was running. He had been on the streets for a long time now. It had been a couple of years since they had killed his family. Two years since he had been on his own. Sometimes people would give him looks of sympathy, spare change, scraps of food, but never enough for him to get by on. Sometimes he was forced to steal food from vendors. Right now he was running from a particularly angry stallkeeper that he had repeatedly stolen rice and bread from. The boy managed to lose the somewhat portly man by running out of the small town and into the nearby woods. Without looking back he kept running to where he had been taking shelter for the past year. The place was nothing more than a small cave that could hardly be called such. It was more of an indention in the rock that provided enough cover for him to lay down with a fire under the covering. It had been hard living alone. The time had forced him to forget some of the things from his past. The 11-year-old boy could hardly survive on his own, but his father had managed to teach him a very small amount about living in the wilderness. Though it only gave him the ability to camp out for a short time. At first he had been able to stave off hunger by taking the scraps and catching small fish, but as time went on he started to become malnourished. As things stood he was lucky to outrun even the stallkeeper that was after him. The cave came into sight before he tripped on a stone. The moment the boy's bare and dirty feet hit the stone he could feel pain shoot up his leg, but the pain was pushed aside as the ground rapidly came up at him, his tattered clothing about to do nothing to dampen his fall on the stones coming up to greet his face. He lost consciousness, but because his sleep was dreamless he felt like he was opening his eyes immediately after they had been closed. He faded out again as the haze in his eyes kept him from seeing much. When he opened his eyes again the fog in his eyes kept him from properly seeing the shadowed figure in front of him very clearly. The sun in his eyes didn't help much either. He blacked out again as he felt himself get picked up. He could hear the words in his ears as he faded away. Lucky I'm in a generous mood or you might have been left here. When he opened his eyes again he was laying on a cot at a dark room. He looked around but could hardly see. What he could see was a silhouette getting on their feet. He tried to speak but his throat was dry and felt like it was broken. When the figure got closer he was able to tell that it was a woman, but failed to make out any of her features. 
When she got to his side she held up his head and put a cup to his lips. Drink. You're dehydrated and need water. Open. Her soft, yet firm, voice said to him. He opened his mouth and felt the cool water flow down his throat. He couldn't say it, but he was grateful for the life-giving substance. When the cup was empty she put his head back down and backed up. When you're back to an acceptable state of health you're going to start training. That might seem random but so long as I'm taking care of you I will also be teaching you how to do it yourself. Whenever you want to leave you can, but if you aren't following my rules and regiments you won't be living here. She said as she turned walked to a door. She opened it, but before she was gone he heard her mumble to herself. Maybe I am getting soft, bringing him here and taking care of him. He then faded out again as tiredness took him. Break. Chronicle opened his eyes. He sighed as he sat up. He dreamed sometimes, but the dreams were always memories. Pictures of his past. He hated his past because it always taunted him. When he saw the memories they would go in sequence of chronology. But he hated them because they would always jump past his name. He could never just see his name. Why couldn't he just see his name? If he was going to see the past why couldn't he see the part that mattered most to him? He saw his life pass by but he never did hear his name. He assumed it was because he didn't memory of it so it didn't appear in his memories. He knew that information didn't just delete itself. It was there but at the same time it was lost. He got out of his bed and decided to leave the lights off. He preferred the dark because it kept him from seeing the world around him. He hated this world that caused him so much pain. He walked over the bathroom connected to the room he slept in. When he got in there he finally turned on the light and squinted momentarily while his pupils adjusted to the intake of light. He looked into the mirror that sat above his sink. He looked at himself. His upper body was uncovered allowing him to look at his body. He was covered in several scars that had come from training and the trails of his life. There were three large, parallel scars that wet diagonally down his chest. These were caused from him fighting a large bear during his training. Others were from battle, some were from survival training, and others were caused by a stupid mistake he had made while tracking food for him and his teacher. He had been chasing after a deer that had run towards a cliff overlooking a large lake. The deer and stopped and turned, but Chronicle's momentum had taken him over the edge to the water waiting below. He had managed to avoid most of the rocks, but had cut himself on the rocks he couldn't see below the surface of the water until it was too late. He was lucky to have survived. Or so his sensei had said. He stopped looking at himself and proceeded to void his bladder, take a shower, and get dressed for the meeting he had soon. Break. The day before the meeting had been the day they had ended the war. When word got around that the Mizukage was defeated most Kiri Shinobi stood down. Any who didn't either took off or were taken down. Afterwards Naruto had joined Chronicle at his northern Kiri assault base. He had also made sure that Yagura was kept away from the Kirian rebel forces so that he would be safe until Naruto took him back to Azushio. Naruto was sitting in a conference room with the people who had recently met with him. They were sitting at the northern assault base that Chronicle had used to attack Kiri. Around the table sat Naruto, Hanata, Shino, the Azu 4, Zabuza, Haku, Mei, Al, Chojuro, Chronicle, Meizu, Gozu, Angela, the leaders of the other organization, the man in blue and white armor, and a few others. When Naruto had first entered the meeting room and seen Meizu and Gozu the three had had a bad start. However, he had gotten over it rather quickly seeing as how they were now on the same side. It helped that Zabuza and Chronicle were there to keep them all in line. So then Azukage, where should we start? Chronicle asked. Why don't we start with you and your motives here? You and your group. All right. First you have the other organization which has the primary goal of maintaining peace where it can. He proceeded to introduce the members and allowed them to tell the goals of ending war and stopping tyranny. Another thing he told them was how they had used seals Naruto might want to look at. When they came here they started out with small towns and villages, eventually gaining support but not really gaining size. Eventually I found them and asked them to join me. At that time my own force was also small, but still larger than theirs. They saw the advantage of joining someone who had the extra forces and had a similar goal to them. Chronicle said. As for me, I started building my group a while back. Now it's been close to five years since I brought Angela into my organization. I had started building my group together several months before that. 
So my organization has been growing just over five years with the goal of changing the world. Changing the world seems pretty broad. May said. Well, I don't know any other way to say it. That's why I sought out the Celestial Knights when they came here. I liked the goals. My own goal is broad, but I agree to support anyone so long as what they do will change the world in a way that I see as making it better. I have helped others, even ones that wanted destruction. Though that was because the people who were part of those organizations believed that they were doing the right thing. Eventually though I had to destroy them because I saw that they wouldn't bring about a better world. They believed so much in what they were doing that it took me far longer than it should have to stop them. So for now you simply need to take my words to heart that my goal is to change the world. Chronicle said with a small smile on his face. So now you Azukage, what about your goals? The same for you May. Since you ended the war what do you plan to do? May was the first to answer. For now there's already a lot of talk about making me the next Mizukage as soon as possible to maintain order and start putting things back on track to start rebuilding Mizu no Kuni. After I help get everything stabilized enough I'm going to start branching out to get support for our recovery. Eventually I intend on helping the Azukage with his goal. However, I leave the rest of that up to him seeing as how he had me give my word not to reveal his identity. She said. People started looking to Naruto as he then stood up, although it didn't make much difference because Naruto still had the lack of height that came with lack of age. Some of you already know who I am. But for those of you who don't, I am Naruto Namikazuzumaki. He said. Afterwards he told them how he was the QB Jinchuriki, as well as how he was betrayed. Well, if that's the case, Chronicle said, you might be interested to know that my own spy network has informed me that they sent out a retrieval team for you. Naruto scoffed. How the tables have turned. Go ahead and give me the information you have they on them when this meeting is over. I will take care of them myself. There was then a pause. Well, as for my goals that you were asking me about, they have recently changed. When I left Kanoa my long-term goal was to destroy Kanoa after I had built Azu to a point where it can stand against the world if it needed to. However, that has changed to become only part of the goal. There are people out there who will never allow the Jinchuiki to have peace. So I will bring them together, and then I will use the combined power of all of the allies I can gather to wipe out the corruption from this world. However, as I said destroying Kanoa is still part of the plan. I will raise Azu to a point where it can stand against the whole of the elemental nations if need be, and then Kanoa will fall, as will all who stand in its way. I will turn Azu into a representative of peace and justice. Chronicle stood up as well. The tension in the room, as well as Ki caused the occupants to become uneasy. Tell me Naruto, what justification do you have for such a goal? It sounds much more like you wish to seat yourself in power over this world by destroying all of your enemies. Not like you really want peace. Let me ask you this chronicle, who doesn't want to have the power to destroy their enemies? The problem with this world is having a good reason for doing it. Mine is to protect those I care about, to bring peace, and to get justice for those of my clan who died when my home was destroyed. Though destroying Kanoa mainly comes from wanting revenge, it also comes from wanting to destroy their corruption. Kanoa has been the source of plenty of destruction in the world. It's only fair that they finally reap what they have sown. But I have no intention of being the evil dictator. If anything, once this is over I will give the title of Azukage to someone else and live peacefully in my home. That is my long-term goal. That is my plan. The key radiating from Chronicle stopped. So then, if you want revenge against those who destroyed Azu, why make an ally out of Mizu? May tensed at this. She knew Kiri had been part of that attack and knew this would be an issue latter, but was now concerned with how this was going. Chronicle, are you suggesting I simply destroy all of the elemental nations? Mizu has suffered enough. Once May is in place she will have my help cleaning up the mess that Yagura's master has caused I will turn my full attention to other things. However, speaking of the person controlling Yagura, did you see him during your fight with Yagura? No, I saw him before the fight. I spoke with him. You might be interested to know he was the one behind the QB attack all those years ago. He decided to leave out the part concerning Madara and his successor. Naruto nodded as he and Chronicle sat back down. I thought so. However, I must ask what you meant by me suggesting you destroy the entire elemental nations. Are that. Well Chronicle, allow me to give you a little history lesson that just might show you the truth. 
Let's start with the origin of the Uzumaki clan. Naruto then explained everything he had to say. During his lesson some of the others in the room asked questions but eventually it came to an end. I see. Chronicle said, a concerned look on his face. Even he hadn't known some of these things. He was not the only one. Naruto had just given them all information that none of them had known. Then you have my word that so long as I see the way you're changing the world as one that will change it for the better, I will give you my support. Chronicle said. Now then, I think that until everything is worked out for the next Mizukage we should save the rest of this meeting for later. Everyone nodded and they stood up to find something else to do. However, Chronicle pulled Naruto aside before they started walking down a series of hallways. Now then, I suppose we should discuss this team that's on its way to retrieve you. Chronicle said with a hint of amusement in his voice. I completely agree. While they were walking Chronicle asked a question that had been bothering him. When you started the attack, how did you create clones of your teammates? There was a pause as Naruto considered his words. Back when I was in Kanoa I had my clones working on an extensive project. One of the parts of the project was to continue the experiments on the cage bunch and jutsu that I started back when I was in Nami no Kuni. I discovered that by using my own chakra and body as a sort of nexus that allows people or animals without the chakra needed, to use the jutsu. Because my chakra is the building block of the jutsu it allows my see the memories of those I allow to use the jutsu with me. But, this does allow them to use the jutsu as if they had my capacity and used it themselves. It's very useful when you want to create an instantly diverse army, or you want to train an animal. I was able to teach a hawk to talk and be a messenger due to that ability. And I was correct. When using that form of the jutsu with others who have bloodlines it becomes infinitely more useful for tipping the scales in your favor. Chronicle nodded. I understand now. That's why you went in first. So that you could take out most of their forces before your own got there. Brilliant. Thank you for explaining that to me. I've been trying to figure that out. It took them a few more minutes of walking down the network of hallways until they came to a door. When they opened it they found a dark room with no light apart from a semicircle of monitors. This semicircle was focused on a man sitting in a swivel chair. The strange part was that he was sitting on his ankles while leaning over so that his knees touched his chest. He was a very slim, tall young man with black hair and dark eyes. One of his most noticeable features was the shadow below each of his eyes. He was wearing blue jean trousers, a long-sleeved, white shirt, and no shoes. Chronicle walked up to him before putting his hand on the young man's shoulder. This here is the head of my intelligence network. The man nodded before standing up. He half walked half shuffled over to a small desk. He picked up a folder before moving back over to Naruto and handing it to him. This, is the information I gathered on anything surrounding what Kanoa is doing about you. Naruto took the file and opened it and flipped to some of the most recent entry. He read up on the team and where it was headed. Well, then I don't have much time to head him off. Naruto said. Break. Naruto was using his shunshun to move faster over the elemental nations. When he stopped he was out of breath and close to chakra exhaustion. However, he was where he wanted to be. Not far from the tree line he saw the small village that Anko was supposed to be waiting for him at. He was no longer wearing his Azukage robe as he wanted to avoid Kanoa knowing about Azushio any time soon. Instead he was in a black, short sleeve shirt with an orange stripe on the shoulders and a white Uzumaki swirl on the back with a black outline. His pants were solid black with his patch strapped to his left thigh. He jumped out of the tree before putting a small military rations pill, or MRP, in his mouth. He had used them to continually allow movement during the month he was keeping the bunshin in his place back in Kanoa. It would eventually stop being enough, but it kept him going long enough. Once that was done he pulled up his shirt to reveal a small seal on his ribs. He applied his hand and activated it. He started walking towards the village before activating the seal again 20 minutes later. By that time he was waiting at the docks. Another half an hour later and a large ship started to pull into one of the docks with a man standing on the bow. The man standing there appeared to be a copy of the man standing on the dock. The man standing on the bow was the bunch and Naruto had sent to Azu to get the black pearl before coming here. Did the barrier put itself back up? Naruto asked. The clone nodded. Good. Glad to know the seal is working. Dispel. Once the clone was gone he sighed. 
Kamaji wanted to talk with him when he really got back. Then Naruto felt someone come up from behind. He turned around to see Anko. Well, I have been waiting for you to make your grand entrance. She said. It gets better. Naruto said before pulling a scroll out of his Izukage robe. He quickly opened it before unsealing it. In a cloud of smoke five figures appeared. When the smoke cleared the newly dubbed Azu Five were sitting in chairs with earplugs and blindfolds. After some debate two things had been decided. The first was that the Azu Four would be called Five due to Sakan and Akon practicing to gain strength when separated. The second thing was that people would be strapped to chairs and given earplugs and blindfolds to prevent the sickness that came from being in sealing scrolls for prolonged periods of time. Naruto then woke him up. The precautions helped, but when Sakan was up he wobbled on his feet before leaning over to puke. He then opened a water canister at his hip to wash his mouth out. You have the sound four with you. Anko asked. Who do you think organized their escape? Naruto responded. Once they could walk he had them and Anko follow him to a small restaurant. He had them sit before ordering his own meal and waiting for the other to do so as well. He had yet to give the Azu 5 all of the details and was about to, along with Anko. Before he got the chance to explain why he brought the 5 Anko spoke up. So where's Hanata and Shino? I'll explain in a moment. First off, they are no longer the Sound 4. They are now the Azu 5. Azu. Also something I will explain. First, I need you all to listen. He said as he got all of their attention. I was able to obtain intel that Kanoa sent a team to get us, you and I Anko. Kakashi, two Anbu, an Avarain clan member, a Hyuga branch member, Kiba, and Sasuke. We don't have long. Also, that's why Hanata and Shino aren't here. If one of them leaves I don't need them reporting it back. That would mess up a plan I have in the works. Anko nodded. So that's why you brought us. Tayuya said. This time Naruto was nodding. Yes, me and Sasuke nearly killed each other last time but I still won. I can do it again. However, I still need someone to handle the others. That's where you come in. Wait, Anko said, what about me? I might be able to hold off to Anbu and Kakashi for a short time, but not that long. I'm a special Jonin but even that will only last so long. Sakan and Akon will assist me with Sasuke and his team, the others will help you against the Anbu and Kakashi. Now, eat your meals, we leave in 20 minutes. We have to if we want to head them off in time. Naruto said as they were brought their food. Why do we have a time limit to head them off? Why can't they meet us here? Jirobo asked. This small village is set up to send supplies to a pickup point every month for a fair fee. I don't feel like destroying it. Break. Sasuke was currently running through the forest nearly 30 minutes from the destination. Kakashi had tried to get him to slow down, but he had only stopped once 20 minutes ago so that he wasn't completely depleted. He didn't think he would need to fight, but knew he should be prepared in case the need arose. However, he was still staying at the front of the group. He was glad that the destination was so close, but it was short-lived. Raisingen. Everything slowed down as Sasuke saw Naruto pass by him at a downward angle. He was trying to attack from above. As things sped back us he saw that the attack was aimed for Kakashi. However, as Kakashi dodged everyone in the group was forced to as well in order to avoid the debris that was shot out of the ground from the destructive orb being shoved into the ground. When the dust settled Naruto was standing in the middle of a small crater with a bunchen to his back and one on each side. Each Naruto had their sword in hand. 5. Anko, you know what to do. Naruto shouted. Before anyone could react there were small explosions causing them all to scatter. On one side Kakashi and the two Anbu were facing Anko, all of the Azu four apart from Sakan and Akon, and two of the Naruto Bunshin. On the other side Naruto, his Bunshin, Sakan, and Akon faced the rest of the retrieval team. Sasuke was the first to shake his surprise and speak. Naruto, what are you doing? What happened to you? We're here to bring you back. And who said I want to go back Sasuke? Before he could respond Anko and the others took off with Kakashi and the two Anbu. Sasuke had the others stand down until Naruto attacked. Naruto, they won't try to kill you again, I'll make sure of it. Sasuke said, trying to convince Naruto. After the words left his mouth he realized how stupid it sounded. I'll make they don't TR to kill you again. It was probably the most pathetic thing he could have thought of and he realized it instantly. H-A-H-A-H-A. -h 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 -h. You think I care Sasuke? 
You are my friend Sasuke, but do not assume that means I will go back to that pisshole of a village. I really don't feel like you making an ass out of the both of us Sasuke, as the saying goes. I will never retune to that village, not before my plan gets to that point. It will be at that time that the village will fall. Naruto, you need to come back with us. I have a better idea, why don't you come back with me? What do you mean? I'm saying, join me so that Kanoa can fall that much easier. No, Naruto that is our home. Your home, not mine. Naruto said as he turned around. Now leave, or attack so that you can bring me back like you were ordered to. If those are the only choices you're going to give me, then it's not much of a choice. Sasuke said before crouching and creating a chidori on his left hand. Naruto turned to face him once again. I will make you a deal Sasuke, defeat me and I, he paused before Sasuke charged. I will tell you the truth of the Uchiha massacre. Naruto said. The moment the words left his mouth Sasuke faltered. He nearly fell over but stopped as the chidori dissipated. He was inches away from Naruto. He knew the Chidori wouldn't kill him so long as it wasn't placed in a vital spot, but it didn't matter anymore. Sasuke straightened and looked Naruto in the eye. That's right Sasuke, how would you like to know why it happened? Hmm. But you have to beat me first. If you don't I will have to have Itachi tell you once I recruit him. Naruto said, keeping his face blank the entire time. Sasuke at that moment didn't know why, but something slipped away. Take him down. Alive. Now. Sasuke yelled. The moment the words left his mouth Naruto's clone took Kiba, while Sakan and Akon took on the Avarame and Hyuga clan members. They quickly forced them away onto their own clearings. The real Naruto was forced on the defensive as Sasuke pulled a kunai out and tried to cut Naruto across his face. He wanted to slow him down and knew it would heal. Naruto quickly dodged before bringing up his sword to block another slash. Naruto took the small delay in Sasuke's reaction to being blocked to push him back. Before Sasuke could go back at it Naruto spoke again. Come on Sasuke, stop trying to hit me and hit my. Ah. Sasuke screamed as he pulled a small tanto out and went back at Naruto again. Sasuke was angry that Naruto was taunting him, this caused his movements to become less controlled, no matter how rapid they were. Every attack he made, Naruto deflected with little trouble. Sasuke raised his tanto to try and bring it down at Naruto's face. He quickly realized how much of a mistake it was as Naruto wasted no time before planting his foot in Sasuke's chest with enough force to send him backwards through a tree, and then put an indent into the next tree. He didn't stay down for long before charging Naruto again. Before he could react Naruto had him by the neck. Sasuke, my bunshin was dispelled by that troublesome Kiba. Excuse me for a moment. Naruto said before spawning another clone. He threw Sasuke into the air before the bunshin jumped up and spun around before using a kick to send Sasuke flying into the trees. Not two seconds later Kiba came from the trees on another side of the clearing with his sharpened nails going for Naruto's throat. Naruto quickly jumped to the side before moving low to the ground so that he could kick a Kamaru in the ribs as the Ninkan tried to bite into Naruto's neck as well. Naruto quickly straightened before jumping away. I don't care what my orders are, you're going to die Kyuubi. Kiba yelled before charging again. Naruto instantly created several bunshin. One quickly grabbed Kiba by the throat and used Kiba's momentum to drive him to the ground. The bunshin turned Kiba's head to make him watch as the real Naruto roundhouse kicked Akamaru away again before using his sword to put the dog across the side. The dog whined in pain. Kiba wanted to scream but he was struggling to breath with the bunshin on top of his neck. Your dog looks to be in pain. Let's put it out of its misery. Naruto said with an evil grin. Kiba wanted to cry out for him to stop as Naruto formed hand seals before shouting. Pit of despair jutsu. Naruto yelled before driving his hands into the ground. The ground opened up under the Ninkan. The dog tried to jump away but its injuries were not the only thing hindering it. As the hole opened up two large hands made out of the earth reached up and grabbed the dog and dragged it down. All hope of stopping this left Kiba as the hole slammed shut with a yelp of pain as Akamaru was crushed. Naruto turned to Kiba. Now that wasn't so bad. Quick and painless. He didn't give Kiba a chance as the clones dispelled only for Naruto himself to grab Kiba by the neck, lifted his head up, and slammed it back down to stun him. He quickly picked Kiba up and threw him into a nearby tree before weaving hand signs again. Katen, Valley of Ashes. 
Naruto yelled before his middle started to glow. In an instant he threw his arms out as an inferno shot out in every direction. Kiba had no chance to do anything as he was still trying to shake the fog out of his mind from his head being slammed into the ground. When the flames cleared all that was left was a much larger clearing made up nothing but burned twigs where the trees used to be, and ashes in place of everything else. On the outside of the clearing most of the trees were crisped and devoid of life. On the far reaches of the Jutsu's range the trees were singed with their leaves burnt off. As he went to leave the clearing to find Sasuke he felt a hand grip his ankle. He looked down to see the destroyed, yet somehow still alive body of Kiba looking up at him. What was left of his face moved, as he tried to speak. Naruto bent down to hear his last words. It was faint and Naruto could barely make it out, but did so nonetheless. Tell my, mother and sister. I'm sorry, that I didn't. Stay alive like, I promised. Kiba ground out with each pause punctuated by the painful intake of air that nearly caused him to die before he could finish. However, when he was done he was still alive somehow. Life clung to him, almost like a disease. Naruto couldn't stand the sight and slashed with his sword. Kiba's head rolled away in the same second. As he stood up he heard screaming. He looked to see a slightly singed Sasuke charging at him. His curse mark covering him body, still in the first stage. Naruto didn't let him get very far as he pulled up his sword and shoved it through Sasuke's heart, and out of Sasuke's back. Sasuke hadn't expected Naruto to go for a killing blow. After all, Naruto had claimed that Sasuke was still his friend. He slumped over as the curse seal receded to its origin point. Why, you said I was your friend, yet you went for a killing blow. You misunderstand Sasuke, Naruto said as he laid the Uchiha down on the ground. He had Sasuke on his back as he removed his sword. I did go for a killing blow, but not with the intention of killing. He saw the confusion on Sasuke's face. It was a gift. I have freed you of Orokimaru. Your wounds are already healing. Naruto said before turning Sasuke over on his side and looking at where his shoulder met his neck. The curse mark was still there. Let me rephrase that. I will have freed you of him in a moment. Naruto placed his hand on the seal before pain shot through Sasuke like billions of needles were entering every pore of his body. He blacked out. His eyes opened a moment later and his bones had a dull ache. He looked up to see Naruto setting him back down. He had blacked out only for a few moments. Now that his influence is gone, I will give you a conciliation prize. I will still tell you about the massacre, but only after I give you a history lesson that will show you the truth. Naruto now had Sasuke's full attention. Before he could continue Saken and Akon landed next to Naruto as he sat down. Naruto, we were able to take care of ours. Saken said. Good, go help Anko and the others with their job. They nodded before disappearing. Now then, allow me to tell you where my thirst for justice comes from. My goal is to create peace and bring about justice. Justice. Are you kidding? Naruto, you killed Kiba. He was our. He paused. He knew that Naruto would never accept that. Kiba and Naruto hated each other. He was my friend. You talked about joining Atachi, the man who slaughtered my clan. You talk about destroying the leaf. My village, if not ours. If you do that, I will have to kill you. Yet doing all of these things, you're talking about justice. What part of that plan brings about peace and justice? Fine, then what do you suggest for bringing those things about? I already told you I would kill you if I had to. Oh, I see, that would be justice if I carried those things out and you killed me. That would be justice, Naruto said, standing up to look down at Sasuke. However, what about my friends? My clan? My village? What about my friends that I want to defend? What about my clan that was slaughtered? What about my village that was destroyed? My village suffered the same fate Kanoa eventually will, at the hands of Kanoa Shinobi. How is it fair to let only you preach about justice? What are you talking about? Allow me to get onto my little history lesson. You might know this first part being a Uchiha, but just in case. I recently came across some documents and personal accounts that helped me piece together the past. Naruto cleared his throat and continued. Long ago there was a man named Hagaramo Otsutsuki, also known as the Sage of Six Paths. Long ago, the Nine Biju didn't exist. Instead they were part of a monster, the Juubi. The Ten Tails. He eventually sealed the monster into himself. He became the first Jinchuriki. However, eventually his life started coming to a close. 
He had to stop the monster from being unleashed when he died, so he used the abilities of the legendary Rinnegan, I'm sure you've heard about that, to divide the Juubi into nine equal parts. The nine Biju. He could hear the QB yelling that they weren't equal, he was the strongest. Naruto ignored him. Now, seeing as how you now know how the Biju came to be, I can get on with my story. Now, the sage had two sons, Asura and Indra. Asura, the younger brother, inherited the sage's body. The older brother, Indra, inherited the sage's eyes. However, before the man died he asked his two sons a question. How should one bring about peace? The older brother said that strength was the answer, the younger said the answer was understanding. He chose that the younger brother should be his successor. It was a foolish decision. He should have told him that his true legacy was for both of his sons to come together, to create a balance between the two, and that they should have worked together to create the peace that neither of them could have created alone. He tried to create a peaceful world by entrusting his legacy to one brother, but instead created a never-ending war. However, it can't be changed now. The point is, that these two brothers become the first Uchiha and the first Senju. Let me guess, Asura was the Senju and Indra was the Uchiha. It wasn't a question. He could tell just by their answers and what they had inherited. Correct, but eyes and body were not the only things they inherited. They also obtained the sage's own writings about his life. He left them histories and such. However, generations later, as the Uchiha clan and Senju clan waged war, two people grew tired of being surrounded by deaths. One was a man of the Senju clan, though he was an odd Senju with red hair, the other a woman of the Uchiha clan who was also odd and also had red hair. For now I will not go into the personal history apart from the fact that they fell in love and decided to take mast of the information about the clans. It wasn't as if anyone cared, the two clans cared about strength at the time, not information and understanding. So they left and eventually found an island home. They formed their own clan. The only reason anyone cared was because of the fact that they were from the two different clans, but they didn't care enough to pursue them when they left. Now, the two eventually had a son. The son had red hair as well. He also had the great Rinnegan. It was due to the two bloodlines mixing once again for the first time in so long. However, he used this this great power not for power, but to create a village. This son of theirs eventually decided to partly follow in the footsteps of the sage. He eventually went onto a battlefield where the senju were using the Kyubi as they had been doing since the sage had died. If you know what it is, it was why the first Uchiha developed the Suzanu, to counter the Biju. So he took the Kyubi from the Senju and sealed it into himself so that it couldn't be used for their war. After that he disappeared and no trace of him was seen until generations later. After the man disappeared he created a clan that inherited the long life of both clans. He created the Uzumaki clan. This son of the Uchiha and Senju, was the first Uzumaki. So generations later his decedents appeared. Over time their relations with the Senju grew much faster than they did with the Uchiha. The Uchiha harbored resentment over the first Uzumaki taking away the only challenge the Senju could offer against the few of them that could manifest the Suzanu. Their honor kept them from using the advanced Sharingan ability. So they resented the Uzumaki because of it. It was also because the Uzumaki were descended from the woman who betrayed and left them. But, over time it stopped mattering as Kanoa was eventually formed. The only problem the Uzumaki ever had with the Uchiha was that before the forming of Kanoa, Mada Uchiha used a Genjutsu to get the Kyubi from its Jinchuriki in Azushiogaku. Afterwards though, it was sealed into Mito Uzumaki who had been married to Hashirama Senju in a political marriage. Eventually they came to love each other, but that doesn't change why they were wed in the first place. Now, decades later Azushio was feared by the entire world. But no one could lay a hand on them due to their relationship with Kanoa. Until one day, Azushio was tired of losing so many people to the death of wars that Kanoa was a part of. They wanted a power and political standing of their own. They agreed to send Kanoa one more Jinchuriki when Mito was near death, but after that they said they would no longer be part of the leaf. Allied, but not part of as they were before. Kanoa had no problem because they would still get aid seeing as how Azu would still be an ally. Until Azu tried to create an organization of their own, they tried getting the small surrounding countries to join them in what they called the Orb Union. They were going to stay out of any war that didn't concern them. They would defend and retaliate, and aid allies, but they would stay out of their wars. Even if they were allies, they were successful until they were destroyed. 
but let me tell you how that happened. One day, the third Hokage was pressed by other nations and his own council to take action against Azu. Eventually he caved and became part of the coordinated attack that destroyed my ancestral home and clan. Now that island country is behind an unbreakable barrier, beyond even my reach. But what else happened around that time? My mother, Kushina Uzumaki, was brought to Kanoa to be the next QB container right before Azushio was destroyed. And then, years later, she got married. Her husband was Minato Namikas, the Yondime. He saw the understanding on Sasuke's face. So then, one day a man in a mask, claiming to be Madara Yusuha, attacked when my mother was about to give birth. During childbirth, you see, the seal weakens. He used this opportunity to unseal the QB and use it to attack the village. But, my father drove him back and sealed the QB into me. He wanted me to be treated like a hero. You see how well his last wish worked out for him. But then my heritage was kept secret, from everyone. They didn't was Iwa or Kumo to come for the son of their most hated enemy. Now, tell me Sasuke, why I should not kill your friends when they tried to kill mine. The sound for, for example. Why shouldn't I join a man who killed your clan when you have joined people who killed mine? Why can't I destroy the village responsible for the destruction of mine? Answer my question Sasuke and I shall tell you the truth behind the Uchiha massacre. Why can I not have my justice? You and I are seeking the very same thing. You and I are the same. We are both motivated by our desire for justice. The justice I will deliver to Kanoa will be no different than what you will try to do to me when I do it. You strive for your justice, and I for mine. So now, answer my question. Why can I not have my justice? I want to know your answer. Sasuke just laid there. After a few moments he spoke. I'm sorry Naruto. I didn't know. And now, I don't know what I should do. There was a pause. Naruto gave a small, half smirk, half smile. Now, I am going to tell you of the Uchiha massacre. Before Naruto could speak again he was forced to jump away as not even a second later three shuriken passed through the space where his head used to be. Naruto and Sasuke looked at where they had come from. From their Kakashi Sime flying out of the trees before landing next to Sasuke. He didn't look good. Ji looked ragged, defeated, and tired. There were cuts and singes all over him, especially a large burn on his shoulder. He quickly kneeled down and grabbed Sasuke before using a shunshun and disappearing. A second later Anko appeared. Anko. What happened? I told you and the others to force him to retreat. We tried. But just a moment ago he took a small fire jutsu to the shoulder and used the dust cloud that was created to make beeline straight for you. The others aren't in very good condition. We couldn't stop him in time. He did retreat, but I'm guessing by your reaction you didn't get the chance to finish. Naruto shook his head. No no I did not. This is not good. You said the others weren't in very good condition either. She nodded. He sighed. Fine. We can't change things now. Get them together and let's go home. You still haven't told me where this home is Naruto. Anko said. She could tell he was still in a bad mood over what had happened, but she wanted answers. Tell me Anko, have you ever heard of Azushio? Break. Naruto was now sitting at his desk with Kamaji, Anko, and the Azu 5. Anko was contemplating everything Naruto had just told her. He had explained the history lesson he had told Sasuke as well as everything he had done since leaving Kanoa. Kamaji already knew everything. So then, what do we do now? Anko asked. Well, for now I want to handle Yagura and one of the other Jinchuriki. There are also a few things I want to discuss. After that we will gather people and grow before we try making a move again. First order of business though, Naruto said before pulling out a box. He handed it to Kamaji. Kamaji, you told me you could handle some politics and during my stay in Mizu you handled things well. I'm going to trust you with everything from now on during times when I'm gone. He said as Kamaji opened the box. Inside was a red hori with blue flames along the bottom and black lettering along the spine. The lettering was the kanji for Nadai Mizukage. Kamaji was stunned. Why? I can't stay here all the time like other cages. What's the point of being so strong if you aren't on the front lines? How can a leader expect his followers to follow if he won't lead from the front with everyone else? I will still be Azukage, but so will you. I need you to handle things here when I'm not here. Kamaji nodded in understanding. Now then, I think it's time to go talk with Yagura. 
break. For the first time in years Yagura slowly opened his eyes as he felt something calling him back to consciousness. Before he cleared the fog from his eyes his memories came back. This included the last thing he remembered. The sharing casting him into a dark pit of illusion. He suddenly jerked up to try and defend himself. His panic rose even more when he realized that his chakra was suppressed and that he was tied down. Then he felt a hand on his shoulder. Then a voice. It felt so far away as he tried to hear the words. Down Yagura. Calm. I need you to. Yagura, you need to listen to. Is no longer controlling you. Calm down and help you understand. Yagura slowly calmed down as his vision and hearing returned. It felt as though he hadn't used them in far too long. He blinked several times as an image of someone with red hair and blue eyes standing over him. If he looked hard enough it seemed that a golden blonde was growing in at the base of the person's hair. Yagura was able to then realize that the person in front of him was only around 14. Then he spoke. Hello Yagura. It has been a long time since you were awake. Sorry about tying you down. I thought you might react violently when you woke up and needed to take precautions. Why? The last thing I remember is the Sharingan. I figured that much. Listen, you have been in a genjutsu for the last few years. The news shocked Yagura. I'm sorry to say this, but you were forced to do some things you come to hate yourself for later. I won't tell you now. I want you to understand that no matter how much you might feel so, you were not responsible for what happened. For now you just need to get used to moving around again. He started to undo the restraints keeping Yagura down. I'll give you an hour to prepare yourself and get used to being awake again. You have been asleep for a few years. By the way, my name in Naruto, Naruto Uzumaki. Naruto said as he finished releasing the straps and then walking out of what now appeared to be a small hospital room. As Naruto walked out of the room Yagura was staying in he was met with Kamaji. Naruto, I figured you might want to know that the people from Snow will be here soon. Good. After I'm done getting there and Yagura settled I'll go back to Mizu to finish things up there and get Hanata and Shino before I go retrieve the Nanabi Jinchuriki. You got that file on them together for me, correct? Yes, her name is Fu. You already know where she is. Her village hates her, so you might want to go get her soon. The sooner, the more she will appreciate you. Break. Naruto was walking through Takagakur looking for Fu. It had been a few days since he had greeted the people from Snow to help them settle in. Some of them were not happy, others were indifferent but were fine about being there, and others were happy to see a new place, especially considering that it was the legendary Azushio. Afterwards he had gone to finish everything in Mizu and bring back Hanata, Shino, and his Azun in. Zabuza and Haku had decided to stay in Kiri for the time being and help keep things in order. Afterwards, Naruto had come back and talked Yagura through everything that had happened in the past years. He had explained how he was the Kyuubi Junkuriki. He also explained how he had resurrected Azu and intended to destroy Kanoa for their betrayal. Naruto continued to search for the girl he was looking for as he walked down the streets. He had managed to sneak in as a civilian. It was easy seeing as how he looked nothing like his bingo book photo. As he walked he saw a sight that nearly made him want to kill everyone around him. He looked at a small alleyway where his target was laying on small layers of cardboard. He walked over to her and knelt down. She was unconscious, and not in good condition. Much like Gara you have suffered your own terrible fate. Do not worry, now I'm here to shatter the world that tries to make us suffer for the burdens we did not choose. Allow me to give you a gift. Naruto said before creating two clones. While he picked up Fu and held her close to him his clones flanked him as he walked out of the alley. The moment he was back on the street people started staring at him, a few moments later he hit a wall of people. Where do you think you're going with the freak? One of them asked. It doesn't concern you since you and anyone else in my way in the next five seconds are going somewhere else entirely. Naruto said with a blank face. And where would that be? Your graves. Naruto said as his clones flashed through hand signs before activating their jutsu. Summoning. They both shouted before the entire surrounding area was engulfed in smoke. When it cleared two large dragons now stood next to Naruto. One was a Japanese dragon that almost appeared to be coiled around itself. It had a green underbelly while the rest of it was red apart from its white mane behind its head. I also had dark blue eyes. The other was a humanoid dragon that appeared to be wearing armor. It wore olden armor on its claws, 
both hands and feet, as well as mostly black armor everywhere else. Its wings almost appeared to be metal feathered wings, with small purple and gold coloring closer to the body while the feathers at the end were a reddish orange. Floating behind it by some invisible force was a golden, stylized disc. Instantly everyone was running. Greeting my friends. These people have tortured the innocent the first hold in my hands. I would like you to make them scream. Spare the children and any who are innocent. But, do so only in the immediate area. If you only leave children who are innocent they will suffer. Even if they are guilty, spare enough to care for the innocent. Naruto said before he continued walking. The two dragon summons quickly set to work destroying everything around them. As Naruto continued walking towards the exit he couldn't help but smirk as he heard their screams of horror at what was happening. Soon this world shall be pushed in the direction of justice. And if need be, I will make sure that push becomes a shove in the right direction. This entire world is about to change. Now all that's left is to finish the few tasks I have left and everything will be set. Break. A few days after Kakashi and Sasuke, all that was left of the retrieval team, returned Sasuke was standing in front of the council. He had just finished telling them everything he had been told. How Naruto had orchestrated the sound shinobi being freed, how he was Minato's and Kushina's son, and everything he had been told about the past behind the Uzumaki. Lies. Said one of the elders that always followed Danzo. No, I was there. Said Sunad. Danzo, you know that the parts about Azu being attacked are true. We were part of it, remember. How could I forget? He said, sighing. I was one of the people that pressured him into attacking. Though, now it seems as though that is coming back to bite us. He said, now contemplating what move he should make next. As for being the son of the Yondime, it has to be impossible. Danzo said. Actually, Jiroya said, Minato's and Kushina's home has been missing from its property. Looked as though it was sealed into a scroll. He shouldn't have even known about it, let alone been able to get near it. As much as I hate to admit it, the possibility that he really is Minato's son gets larger every passing moment. And then there's the sound shinobi he has with him. Next time he will be stronger. I want to take Sasuke on a training trip. Naruto will be getting stronger, he needs to train as much as possible. I agree, said Chum. He needs to be taken down for what he did to my son. And he will, Sunad said. After the meeting was over Sasuke walked out quickly. He wondered if he had made the correct choice in not telling them that Naruto was about to tell them about the truth behind the Uchiha massacre. He still didn't trust them, but he did need them. Break. The Akachoi were once again gathered on the fingertips of the statue. I will now be changing the teams to a degree, said the leader. Sasori, from now on you will be partnered with Kakazu to replace Hidden. Hey, what about me? Diodara asked. You will be partnered with our newest member. Payne said as a man in the regular Akatsuki cloak and an orange mask appeared. The man in the mask spoke in a high-pitched childish voice as he flung his arms around and spun in place. Oh boy, oh boy, I can't wait to start working with you Diodara Senpai. W -o, -o, o As he finished he spun downward into a sitting position on the finger he was designated for. Diodara sweat dropped as he looked at Payne with a face that asked if he was serious and pointed at the new member. You can't be serious. This guy is an S-rank missing nin. Payne nodded. Now, we have a problem that we need to discuss. What is it now? First Orokimaru, then the QB brat, now what? Asked Kissim. Actually, it is still the QB. It took work, but we were able to confirm that a man going by Azukage was in Kiri. He helped end the war there and took the Sanbi with him. It took a lot of work on the part of our intelligence network, but we were able to confirm that the QB was the Azukage. Then, a man matching the Azukage's description attacked Takagakur. Hmm. Perhaps I should thank him for that. Kakazu interrupted. As I was saying, he took the Nanabi with him. Then he disappeared as he did after leaving Kanoa. This is a problem. They must be found. No matter how many of the Biju we get, it won't matter without those three. You are dismissed for now. I want them found. As Atachi faded away he couldn't help but give a small smirk at how much trouble Naruto was causing. Break. Chronicle was laying down as he started to remember some of his time with his mentor. As the scene came into focus he drifted off to relive the moment in his mind. Break. The boy had been living with the woman for a long time now. The woman had white hair, blue eyes, wore a long black trench coat, 
black pants, and a white shirt that exposed part of her midsection. Originally she would not treat him like an orphan or adopted child, but rather orders him around like her assistant, and sexually harasses him on numerous occasions. However, as the years passed and he grew, she had become a morally questionable guardian for him. He had been living with her for eight years, and now the results were ready to show. They never used names. It was never needed because it was just the two of them. However, as they were gearing up they were about to give each other identities for the first time. They had been hired to do a job, but against their wishes were to join a team on said mission. Alright, while working with these guys we will be working with code names. She said. Alright, he responded, I will go by the designation Chronicle. Niece, she said while giving a smile, you can call me Natalia Kaminsky. Break. Chronicle shot up out of his bed and across the room to a small table with a book on it. He opened it before clicking a pen and writing down on one of the blank pages. Every page was filled in with memories he had written down to keep from forgetting them. He had long ago forgotten why he had called her Natalia before he had left, and the memory always stopped before she said her code name. That was why. That was the missing piece. He jotted it down before closing the book and walking over to a chair that he proceeded to slump down into. He picked up a small, glass cup sitting on a stump of a table next to the chair. The cup was empty, but that didn't matter as he hurled it across the room. The shattered pieces went everywhere due to the sheer force behind the throw. One year. It has been an entire year since I remembered something new. I wonder if I will ever remember my name, he muttered to himself. He knew that he shouldn't care that much, but it was the one thing he had forgotten that was important to him. His name was all he had left of his parents, but that wasn't why he cared. It simply infuriated him that all he could go by now was Chronicle. He had tried to call himself other names, to adopt a name and live a normal life, but Chronicle was the only other name in his life that was important to him. But, then what do I do? I can't remember, and it will probably never come to me. So why can't I move on? But then a thought came to him. He sighed. I guess it's exactly because I can't remember that I can't let it go. He closed his eyes before drifting back off into sleep. That will be it for this video if you want more comment down below, like, subscribe. And see you guys later.